Thank you. Thank you for that lovely welcome today. Let's, let's welcome the guys who are joining us online in Cambridge, Leicester, wherever you are today. Welcome. So glad you could be with us today. And welcome to the next part of this, looking at this amazing talk that Jesus gave, which has been recognised to be the greatest sermon of all time, the Sermon on the Mount. Well, today we're kind of right in the middle of Jesus' message. We're in chapter 6. Uh, and throughout this chapter, we see that Jesus is speaking into this kind of key question for, I think, all human beings. How can we live secure with a deep sense of inner security and peace in a world that keeps changing and a world that's insecure? And what Jesus is teaching us here very clearly is the core of this is about putting our trust in our Heavenly Father who loves us, who's for us, and to do that through three key practices, praying, fasting, and giving. There are other ways, but particularly those three. Now, today, we're going to come back to the theme of giving. So we look at verses uh, 19 to 24. Now, interestingly enough, in this chapter 6, Jesus spends 21 out of 34 verses speaking about the whole issue of money. Now, why would that be? Why would he give much more time to giving than he would to praying and fasting? Well, it's because it matters to Jesus. Why? Because it matters to you and me. Come on, be honest with me. How, how many of you would say in these last few weeks and months, one of the things that's probably highest in your thought life is what am I doing about my money? You know, if, if I was to ask you today, how secure do you feel about your financial position? You know, I, I wonder, wonder what your answer would be. I, I'm sure there's some of you, you've had a good two years. Things have gone well during the last couple of years. And actually, you're okay. You're at peace. But I know, I watch the news enough, I read enough newspapers to know there's a whole bunch of people who are listening today and actually you are deeply afraid. You are wondering, where is your next meal coming from? Well, I've got, I've got amazing news for you. Over these next two weeks, we're going to take two weeks to look at this subject because Jesus takes more time on it. Jesus has a great plan for you. He wants to provide for your need. And what I want to do just to set up these next two weeks, because we're going to look at this over two weeks, I want to set you with a little diagram that I hope will help you understand where we're getting to and will help you reorientate where we've got to. A diagram looks like this. Now, down the centre, this, this is a roadway, uh, depending on where you're from, a highway or a motorway. And if you like, that bit represents God's plan for your financial peace and freedom. Now, some of you may know, I've been a Christ follower now for over 40 years. Hard to believe, I know. And I actually believe this whole area of finance and giving is where God has done some of his most transformative work, certainly in my life. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, you grew up in Yorkshire. You needed all the help you could get in this area. And there's, there's, there's an element of truth in that. But I tell you, over the last 40 years, if I've discovered anything about God, it is that, first of all, He is interested in your daily life. You know, this, this whole passage we're going to look at today is in the context of Jesus already having said, pray to a Father who knows what you need. Do you know, Father God knows what you need. Whatever your financial position is, he knows what you need. And more than that, he wants to help you. This is a father about whom Jesus says, pray this, pray. Give us today our daily bread. This father, I, I, I would say to you, wherever you're at today, he wants to meet your every need. And he wants to partner with you, not just to meet your need, but actually to do a remarkable work in you so that God can pour material blessing through your hands into the life of others. Now, as we look over these next two weeks, you'll see that's, that's God's plan for your life and my life. That's what he wants to do. But did you notice there are two ditches? There's one either side. And if you like, these are two traps that you and I can fall into in this whole area. The, one of the ditches is called poverty or the fear of lack. And next week, we're going to dive into that in some detail. T -t -t Jesus actually says, be anxious for nothing. 
Can you imagine a life where you have peace no matter what's going on in the economy, no matter what's happening to fuel prices or food prices, because you know you've got a father who's looking after you. We'll come back next week because we're going to dive into that. But actually today, we're going to look at the other ditch, which we've defined as, or Jesus defines, as the ditch of materialism. Now, I don't know how you would define materialism. For me, it's the opposite of contentment. It's that insatiable never satisfied desire for more. I've got to have more possessions. And actually, behind it, it's like there's a lie that says, it's like this, it's on the horizon. If you get this, if you do that, if you go there, then you'll find peace and joy. And you get there, uh, oh no, it's moved a bit further out, moved a bit further out. And if you're as old as I am, you'll realise you never quite reach the horizon. It's kind of like drinking salt water. You get a bit, you think it's going to satisfy your need, but it never actually does. Now, actually, Jesus presents it here as a hidden slavery that you or I can actually be slave to this thing called materialism, not know it, but it's actually binding us and holding us causing fear and anxiety to dominate our lives. Jesus wants you and I to live free of materialism. In this this passage, he gives us, in these six verses, it's like he builds a case for getting free. And he, he gives us three comparisons. He talks about two treasures, two conditions, and two masters. And in each case, it's like, if we will say yes to Jesus, it's like we're taking a big fat axe and we're smashing away at those chains of materialism. We're going, no, we will not be people who are bound by this hidden, dominant slavery in your name. So I'm going to give you three choices today that I believe if you and I will engage with these and make these choices today, in a sense, I believe you can actually walk into even this week with a new measure of peace and freedom like you've never known before. Number one, Jesus says this is number one, invest in your heavenly bank account. Now, listen to these words of Jesus. He says this, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now, what's Jesus saying here? Well, first of all, I want you to see what he's not saying. Okay, he is not saying that you can't have provision for your need. Okay, if we look at the wider teaching of the Bible, it's very clear that God supplies us with finance in order to have our needs met. But please notice it's the word need, which is spelt different from the word greed or even the word wants. In fact, Paul, later on, he says, if I have food and clothing, that's enough. Now, I'm going to add in shelter because we don't, we don't live in, in the Middle East. We live in England where it's cold and wet. But he's actually saying that's the level. He's saying that's the level of enough. Anything above that is actually we're getting into the wants area. And it's not saying that you can't have wants. He just doesn't want those wants to have you. He wants you free of them. In fact, the Bible says it's okay to save for the future. So please, this is so important. Please hear me. I am not saying, Jesus is not saying it's wrong to have stuff. Just don't let stuff have you. Uh, Solomon said this. He said, The plans of the diligent lead to profit, as surely as haste leads to poverty. The wise store up. They make plans. Choice food and olive oil. But fools gulp theirs down. So if we go back to Jesus' words, what is he saying? Well, it's very interesting here. Jesus is saying here, in effect, think, think of your resource that is above the basic needs of life. And he's asking us the question, what kind of an investor are you with that stuff that's above that level? Are you a smart investor or are you a foolish investor? And he says there are two options. Option number one, invest the extra only in the things of this life. Keep accumulating, if you will, in your earthly bank account. Better house, bigger car, newer clothing. Now, there's there's nothing wrong with those things per se, but he's saying, Jesus is saying very clearly, they are not a good long-term investment. They're all subject to moths, to rust, and even to robbers. In fact, he's saying here, but come on folks, let's see this. There is a rock solid 100% guarantee that at some point they will disappear. They will fade away. They will not last. In fact, Jesus is saying, see the reality. Materialism is ultimately futile 
and its pursuit is stupid. It's gone very quiet on me today. Now, I want to pause here for a moment, okay? We live in a society that is probably the most materialistic society there's ever been in terms of the global world. And we are bombarded by this message. There's a lie that says, if only you get this thing, then you will be happy. I have a guess. How many adverts do you think the average person sees on an average day? Just have a th think. How many do you think is the average number of adverts the average person sees on an average day? Well, recent surveys have said the answer to that is somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000. Now, I'm, I don't know whether the numbers are completely accurate. All I do know is that there are big numbers. And what is every one of those, those adverts, or not everyone, most of those adverts are saying to us, what you have is not enough. Do not be content with what you have. You need more in order to be content. And you know what that is? A big, fat, hairy lie. And we need to see that. We need to call that out and recognise that is a lie. <laughs> Thank you. Just, just for a moment, I'm not here to make you miserable, but you might have to get miserable before you get happy. That, that phone or car or clothing that you think you need, hear me on this, it's not long before that will have been superseded. It no longer be cool. It will have been got by. I used to love a Sendo flip phone. Remember them? Don't laugh. It was cool. Well, now you wouldn't buy one, would you? Because it's, it's just not cool enough. But this is the reality of pretty much every single material thing you get. Those clothes you want to buy, nothing wrong with buying them, but be real. Eventually, a moth will get them and they will get eaten. That new car that you think is going to change your life, one day it will be a pile of rust and will have disappeared. Even, Jesus is saying, the most precious things we've got where you go, my precious, and we stick it in a safe place can be subject to robbers and thieves. None of them are guaranteed. And Jesus is saying, look at this. See it for what it is. It's a 100% guarantee not to last. She says, are you a smart investor? She says, actually, he says, there's a wiser way to use the extra resource you've got. He says, put it into a heavenly bank account. He's saying there's another way of investing our resources where there's a completely different guarantee. This one is guaranteed to last not just for your lifetime, but into eternity. To keep on giving returns, not just in this life, but actually into the eternal life. Not just for this short span of time you've got on life, but millions of years that you and I are going to live for. It will provide returns for that length of time. Now, I want to be clear here. When you look at Matthew 5, 6, and 7, there's a theme that runs through where Jesus keeps talking about rewards. Do you know Jesus wants to reward you? And when you and I do things with the right motives, there is a reward. Some of it is for this life. When you follow Jesus' way, there is a release of peace and joy you can't get from anywhere else. But he's also saying there are some things that you do between now and when you die that are going to be saved up for eternity where you will get the rewards then. One day, I'm sure you all know this, one day you and I are going to die. One day we will meet Jesus face to face. And if you've given your life to Jesus, the guarantee is that you will live with him forever and it's glorious. But you know, the day you gave your life to Jesus, I believe something else happened. He opened for you, with your name on it, a heavenly bank account. And it's like... Some of the things that you do between now and that day, it's like you are depositing into your heavenly bank account. Things that, and John Stott puts it this way, anything you do in this life that has an eternal consequence is a deposit into your heavenly bank account. You know, the Bible talks about things like growing in Christ-like character, speaking to others about Jesus, using your gifts for God's glory, praying, fasting, and giving. He says to a rich young man who wants to know, how can I get to heaven? Jesus says, okay, sell your possessions. Give to the poor and you will have, here it is, treasure in heaven. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. Maybe you're not yet a Christian. You haven't given your life to Jesus. Well, at the, the end of today's message, you will get opportunity. And we want to say to you with all, all our heart, join us in this kingdom adventure. Give your life to Jesus. You know, for the rest of us on that day, going to open that bank account 
and we're going to see what we've deposited in it. And I want to encourage you, every time you are thinking of making a purchase, do you know that moment when it's like, oh, I've got to have this thing? Is it just me that feels like? Got to have that whatever it is. Interrupt that thought and think, hold on, do I actually need that? Is, it actually so, is there somewhere I could actually switch that finance and put it into a heavenly bank account where one day it's going to bring a return forever, not just for a few years. The first thing Jesus said, you want to deal with materialism, start learning how to invest in your heavenly bank account. Number two, second way to break the hold of materialism. He says, keep growing in generosity. Say generosity to the person next to you. Thank you, I needed a drink. <laughs> now what Jesus does in these this next two verses is he's talked about our treasure, where that's going, and now he says, I want you to understand the condition, two conditions that happen when we choose what to do with our treasure. He says this, the eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now, it's not immediately obvious what Jesus is saying. But what he is saying is just as the condition of your eye, healthy or unhealthy, determines how your whole life goes, in the same way, your approach to money and generosity determines more than just your relationship with money. It determines, in a sense, how every area of your life will go. Just as if, imagine if today, you were, and God willing you won't be, you were suddenly struck blind. Your life would change. It would be like darkness becomes the norm, probably an increase in fear. There's a narrowness in life. And Jesus is saying, as if we give ourselves to money, that's what happens. The world becomes smaller and smaller. But he's saying, if you have a healthy eye, a healthy heart, and that word healthy there can be translated as the word generous, if you have a generous heart, it impacts the whole of your life. Life broadens out. Solomon wrote this in the Old Testament. He said, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Think of those of you who know the Scrooge story. Think of Scrooge. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped. Now, I don't know about you. If that's the case, then I want to live a life of generosity. I want my life to get wider and wider, blessing to increase in me and through me to other people. And here's the thing. This, this I believe, it's a journey of generosity. It's not a destination. It's a journey you go on in your life. And this is for everyone. You know, it doesn't matter how wealthy you are. Generosity is a condition of the heart, not of the size of your bank account. Some of the most generous people I've met in my life live in incredible poverty. And yet when you meet them, it's like everything they have they open to you. So don't let this be, oh, this is for the wealthy. No, this is for everybody. So what does it mean to go on a journey of generosity? Well, I would say there's a predictable pattern that takes place. In my many years as a pastor, many years as a human being, uh, watching how we respond to God's word, I think there's a pattern. The pattern is this. You read something in the Bible or you hear something taught, and because it's on money, the first reaction is, not a chance, or fear or anxiety. Then when we do obey, we suddenly find something shifts in our heart and often in our circumstances. And then over time, you start to realize obedience is a good thing to do because Father is a good father, and as we walk in his way, blessing comes to us and through us. But what's the first stage? My own experience the experience of hundreds, maybe thousands of people in this church is the first stage is to start tithing. Now, I, and that means, for those of you who've never heard of it, it means to bring the first 10% of your income into the local church family. Now, I can still remember the feeling in the pit of my stomach as a Yorkshireman. When I heard that teaching, I was like, 10%? Knock an, 10%? Knock a naught off? And I'll be okay. And I can actually remember, I'm not proud of this, saying to Zia, not a chance. We're not going there. Anyway, long story short, Zia and I pray about that. And over time we say, okay, the Bible says, test me in this, we're going to test him in it. So that the first month we decide, we do the 10%, we do the math, we give it in. The end of that month was the first month in our married life where we didn't have extra debt at the end of the month. God is good. 
First time ever. And we, we, were not, we were not a family in great debt, but neither were we a family with margin. I've been tithing now for over 20 years. There is no way that I would go back to not tithing. Because I believe every single time, every time my uh, direct debit, whatever it's called, goes off, it's like I'm going to materialism. No, I'm not going to put you first in my life. I have a heavenly father who's looking after me and he's promised to provide for my every need. And it's like every month you're going, chop that, chop that thing. So I want to say to you today, I want to challenge you today. If you've never tithed or you used to and you've stopped, I want to encourage you to step back in. To actually say, this month, don't delay. Yes, talk to some others. Find out if you want to go wider, look on our Next Steps teaching. You'll see there's some much broader biblical teaching on there that will help you understand the tithe. But I want to encourage you, find out what God is like. But please notice this. Don't just think about the 10%, think about the other 90%. It's not give God the 10th and do what you like with the rest. Bring your spending into line. Get your plastic card and do some plastic surgery if you need to. But understand, God is interested in the lot, but the tithe is the beginning. Now, many people will say in this church, it's certainly true for me, that does something, and then you go on a journey with God. Because <laughs> you're going to love this. Tithing is not generosity. Tithing is the beginning of a journey of realizing God wants to pour blessing into you and through you to others. Well, let me just read out one of the, a testimony from one of our longest standing couples, actually in Cambridge. They wrote this, they say, over the past few years, in addition to our tithe, we decided to steadily increase the percentage of our income that we give away as offerings. We now give away more in offerings than we give in tithes. As we've challenged ourselves to be more and more generous and to hold our possessions lightly, God keeps surprising us with his generosity. During the first lockdown, I had no work for six months and yet somehow ended the year in surplus. We would encourage anyone to start on the journey of generosity. It's thrilling and you won't look back. So if we want to deal with that stronghold of materialism, that God of materialism, let's invest in our heavenly bank account. And second, let's get on that journey of generosity. Third, Jesus says this. This is the third choice Jesus gives us. He says, live all of life like a steward. Now I wonder if you know the difference between an owner and a steward. Okay, an owner says, all I have, all I have is mine to do with whatever I like. A steward says, everything I have has come from someone else. I'm grateful for everything I have and everything he's given me and it's up to him what I do with it. When we come to this, this third choice, really we're right at the core of Jesus' challenge to you and me because he's saying to us, who is, who is it or what is it that's ultimately in charge of your practical provision. Jesus says this. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus is giving you and me a clear and stark choice. He's saying, either have money as your God, if that's your choice, or your heavenly father. That's your choice. You can't have both. There is one throne in your heart and only one, one can sit on there. That's why when he uses says that word money, actually a better translation is the word mammon. Because mammon is a, an implication. Jesus is saying here, behind money there is a power. There is a force. It's like a God. And that God is like a slave master. When he uses the word master, he's talking about slavery. Because, you know, slavery is a 24 hours a day, seven day a week deal. It's being under the control of somebody else for whom you are just a thing. You're not a person. And your life goes according to their direction. Jesus is saying, realize, this is what materialism does to the condition of our hearts. It's a terrible bondage to be under. And I would suspect there's some of you today. I mean, I, I taste it. Nearly every day, you can feel that draw towards it. Have to make a fresh choice to say no. But for some of you, if you're honest, and you might even be a Christian, this is a God in your life. And it's a, there's a war inside. And Jesus is saying, you can't have both. It's one or the other that's on the throne of your life. Jesus wants you free from that bondage. He wants you free from fear of lack. 
and he wants you free for him to pour his blessing into you, through you and to others. And the key here is to live all of life as a steward, to recognise everything you have, from the breath in your body to the striped socks in your drawers, have come from him. Every last bit of it. And to live life grateful for what you have, not avaricious for what you don't have. That's the opposite of materialism, a deep contentment that says, I'm content, I have enough. God has supplied my every need. And then to seek to use everything he's put into your hand for his honour and by his leading. So that when you come to a purchase, it's not do I want it. That's okay, it's okay to want stuff. But it is, is it okay with him? I wonder if you've ever stopped to say, God, I'm going to make this purchase. And I, I'm, hear me please, I don't mean like 2p for a sweet. Okay, you can make that decision. I mean the big stuff. Ever stop and say, God, is this okay with you? Are you okay with this purchase? And then listen, see what he says. If you're anything like me, when that desire to purchase comes, I need a space. <laughs> what they call a cooling off period. Even insurance companies realise this. You need a cooling off period to let that kind of pleasure, that hit on your brain go away so you can make a decision that's pleasing to the Lord. You see, at the end of the day, the subject of money, it's not really about money. It's about the condition of your heart. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 21, right in the middle of this section, he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, please see this. What's Jesus saying? He is not saying your treasure will follow your heart. He's saying, no, no, no. He's saying your heart will follow your treasure. <laughs> Different way around from what we expect. In other words, if I am giving the majority of all I have to what happens in this life, all of my money to making my life better, if I'm keeping stuff to myself, then actually my heart is just going to the things of this earth. Jesus is saying, no, I don't want a bit of your heart, I want the whole of your heart. And he wants to help you break that fear and that drawing to materialism by saying, make him the Lord of every area, even of your spending. You know, I, I, I believe today <laughs> with all my being that God wants to do something significant in our lives today and next week. And that if we will make right choices with him, if we'll say, God, I'm, I'm gonna, I am gonna stop and pause when it comes to purchases. I am gonna think about what I'm investing in. I'm gonna become a smart investor. I am gonna take a next step on that journey of generosity. It might be a tiny step, but it's a step towards financial freedom. And Lord, I want you and you only in my heart. I don't want anybody or anything else in there as a rival to you. I tell you, you will experience new levels of freedom, of joy, of contentment. Some people like you've never known. You can't imagine a life where there is money at the end of the month and where there's peace and where you can, when God says give to that need, you can go, yes, Lord, not, not a chance, Lord. Because that's what I believe God wants for every one of us. I wonder where, wherever you are right now in the room, would you just stand with me? We're going to respond to, to what we've heard today. We're going to respond by, I don't know about you, I, I mean, I, maybe because I've been preparing for this message, but I've felt that lure of materialism <laughs> like every day. Anybody else? So you, okay, yeah, okay, a few people, okay. I think we all do because of the society that we live in. And I don't want my life to be bound by a deception and a lie. Anybody else? So we're, we're going to do some business together. We're going to start by lifting up the name of Jesus. Just, just close your eyes for a moment. Just think about the good things that you have and think simple. The breath in your body it's only there because of Jesus. <laughs> you didn't do anything to earn that breath. If you're a Christian, forgiveness. You didn't do anything to earn that. Free gift from him. Peace, direction, purpose, all from him. If you've got a roof over your head, it's his provision. If you've got some food in the fridge, that's practical evidence of his goodness to you. 
We're going to take a few moments to thank God. We're going to sing a song that you, you know well, but in the midst of it, it's this, God, you're good. In fact, just lift your hands with me. Come on, let's, let's lift our hands. It's a way of saying, God, we're so grateful. Almost like everything I have in my hands, God, it has come from you.